Hello guys, I'm Dr. Sajjad Pathan and I welcome you all to another episode where we look at five questions related to your MR Chem or the FR Chem examinations. Let's begin this talk today with the first question of the day. A 35 year old female with past medical history of von Wilbrandt disease presents with epistaxis. The patient reports being hit in the nose with a football two hours prior to arrival. Despite constant pressure, she is unable to stop the bleeding. What medication is appropriate for this patient? Our choices are cryoprecipitate, desmopressin, nasal spray, factor 8 concentrate, factor 9 concentrate and platelet transfusion. Let's pause over here for 10 seconds and select our answer. Let us now look at the explanation given. Von Wilbrandt disease is the most common autosomal dominant condition leading to prolonged bleeding. It's because of deficiency or ineffective von Wilbrandt factor. The deficiency of von Wilbrandt factor will lead to reduced efficiency of the platelets to adhere to the endothelium. These patients can present with gingival bleeding, epistaxis or menorrhagia. Initial treatment for minor bleeding secondary to von Wilbrandt disease can be managed by IV, subcute or intranasal desmopressin. But for refractory cases or severe cases, factor 7 infusions or cryoprecipitated, cryoprecipitate may be needed. Factor 8 and 9 are given to patients with hemophilia A and B respectively. Platelet transfusions are indicated for thrombocytopenia. In von Wilbrandt disease, the platelet count is normal so platelet transfusion is not necessary. I hope you got that one correct. Now let us move on to look at question number two. A 55 year old male with history of epilepsy, hypertension, depression and atrial fibrillation presents to the emergency department with a three week history of fatigue as well as easy bruising and frequent episodes of epistaxis. His complete blood count shows pancytopenia with moderate depression of all three cell lines. Which of the following medication is the most likely reason for his pancytopenia? Our options are amlodipine, fluoxetine, lisinopril, phenytoin and warfarin. Let us take a pause of 10 seconds and choose our answer. Let us now look at the explanation given. They have described us a patient with decreased cell lines. That means the RBCs are depleted, WBCs are depleted, platelets are depleted. That means the patient is having an aplastic crisis. The way I want you to remember this is the drugs that cause aplastic crisis usually begin with C. Okay, let us look at the explanation over here, what they have given to us. Aplastic anemia. The two most common medications associated with this disorder are chemotherapeutic agents and anticonvulsants. As I've said, chemotherapy starts with a C. Convulsants or anticonvulsant is another C. Think of Cs. Chloramphenicol, carbimazole, chloroquine, chlorothiazide, chlorpromazine, clozapine, chlordizepoxide, chlorpropamide, chemotherapy. If you want further, apart from the drugs, it is cytomegalovirus and hepatitis C and some cases of HIV as well. Amlodipine can cause bradycardia or hypotension. It is unlikely that amlodipine can precipitate aplastic crisis. Fluoxetine can cause serotonin syndrome when combined with other serotonergic medications. Lisinopril can precipitate angioedema no matter for how long the patient has been taking the ACE inhibitor they can precipitate angioedema. Warfarin can induce skin necrosis especially in patients with protein C and S deficiency. So from this the conclusion is this drug which is responsible for the aplastic crisis is phenytoin. Let us now look at question number three. 
A 65 year old male with an unknown medical history is brought in by ambulance with altered mental status after being found unconscious in his parked car on a hot summer day. You note that he appears very dry and his skin is warm to touch. His initial vital signs include a blood pressure of 105 over 75, heart rate of 122, respiratory rate of 24, oxygen saturation of 96%, a rectal temperature is obtained and measures 40.5 degrees Celsius. He is cooled by spraying ice cold water and using fans and his temperature is now 37.5 degrees. But he still is confused and is vigorously shivering. What treatment could be offered now? Our options are Dantrolene, Paracetamol, Lorazepam, Chlorpromazine, Bromocryptine. We take another pause of 10 seconds and select our answer. Let us now look at the explanation. This scenario describes a case of heat stroke. The importance of passive and active cooling cannot be emphasized much. Passive cooling with ice water immersion or convection evaporative cooling can be done. Active cooling with cold IV fluids and NG wash can be given. Bladder wash may be carried out. But as the patient cools, he may suffer from vigorous shivering as in this scenario. This shivering can be controlled with benzodiazepine or chlorpromazine. Benzodiazepine over here is preferred over chlorpromazine as the latter can induce anticholinergic response that may impair sweating and precipitate hypotension. Dantrolene, acetaminophen or bromocryptine is not effective in heat stroke. Dantrolene is very effective in malignant hyperthermia and in order to manage hyperthermia in serotonin syndrome or neuroleptic malignant syndrome. However, bromocryptine is an ant antidote used in neuroleptic malignant syndrome and the antidote for serotonin syndrome is cyproheptadine. Let us now look at question number four. A 60 year old woman with acute myeloblastic leukemia currently undergoing chemotherapy presents with chest pain and confusion. She is tachycardic and hypotensive with clear lungs. Her EKG shows a regular narrow complex tachycardia with low voltage. The patient is on warfarin for a prior deep vein thrombosis and her INR level is therapeutic. A portable chest radiograph is significant for cardiomegaly. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? They have given us the options of bedside ultrasound, oncology consult, broad spectrum antibiotics, CTPA or start vasopressors and admit in the intensive care unit. Let us take a pause and select our answer. Let us now look at the explanation given to us. The patient describes a lady with chemotherapy which is ongoing and she's come in with chest pain. The chest pain, the X-ray shows cardiomegaly and ECG shows low voltage complexes. Now this patient is in shock. We'll come down to the diagnosis in a bit. This patient in, is in shock and what are the common causes of shock? Let us take out hypovolemia or hemorrhagic shock. So this is not the scenario over here. She's not been vomiting or having diarrhea neither. She has succumbed a trauma. The other are cardiogenic possible obstructive that is your tamponade or a pneumothorax neurologic there's no spinal injury or septic shock likely can be possible the single most important investigation which can answer our question to the type of shock is ultrasound bedside ultrasound will be able to differentiate between a pulmonary embolism versus a cardiogenic shock versus a tamponade versus a pneumothorax. So a simple non-invasive investigation at the bedside will give you a diagnosis. Antibiotics may be required considering a diagnosis of new, uh, neutropenic sepsis and we may need vasopressors but this scenario describes classically of a cardiac tamponade with low voltage QRS complexes and patient is in shock which is quite common. The patient is already also on warfarin, which can add on to the problem. So the answer over is bedside ultrasound. 
without wasting further time let us look at the last question of the day a patient receiving a transfusion of fresh frozen plasma becomes short of breath which of the following is most accurate regarding transfusion related acute lung injury changes on chest x-ray typically do not occur until after tw first 12 hours of symptoms it is commonly a fatal reaction pulmonary infiltrates on chest x-ray are classically bilateral treatment involves aggressive diuresis treatment involves broad spectrum antibiotics we will take a pause of 10 seconds and choose our answer let us now look at the explanation here they are describing a scenario where patient is getting fresh frozen plasma for some reason or the other and the patient develops shortness of breath that means the patient is having a transfusion related acute lung injury over here which is fairly common when transfusing a lot of blood products transfusion related acute lung injury is seen relatively within 6 hours on a chest x-ray so the first option is incorrect it doesn't need antibiotics they don't play a role this is not a fluid overload state so this doesn't need diuresis as well and it is rarely fatal supportive care is needed in most of the cases so the answer over here is option number three pulmonary infiltrates appears bilaterally on the chest x-ray that's all for now we have looked at five concepts over here i will see you soon in my next video till then happy studying stay safe stay blessed and peace